sound okay? Good? Uh, thank you, Anne, for the gracious introduction. Sounds a little feedback to me, but we'll go with it. Um, as the one who typically makes the introductions for these lectures, it's funny to find myself now as the one who's introduced. So before taking on the mantle of the lecturer proper, I'd like to take this opportunity of this first lecture to introduce and frame the, the series for the quarter. Uh, as Anne has already mentioned, that's the phone. How's that? Good? Can you still hear me? So, uh, as Anne's already mentioned, the theme for this quarter is territory. And with the term territory, it's really intended to, one, speak to the fact that all three sections of the school somehow deal with the notion of territory uh, as a kind of geometric description of land in one way or another, but also in the idea of territory of uh, disciplinary territory, what it is that an architect does versus landscape versus urban planning, and trying to understand the confines of our territory, its opportunities, and also uh, potentials for re-territorialization. Um, the speakers in this series, of course, I'm the first speaker. I'm part of a tradition in the school that we have one of the KSA faculty lecture as part of the series. I am in that position now. Uh, other speakers for the quarter we have coming up are Monica Ponce de Leon, the new dean at Michigan, uh, Matthias Bau, who's a Dutch architect uh, who does very interesting work at the intersection of urbanism and landscape and, and architecture. Uh, Robert Sommel, who is a former faculty here, who's now the chairman of the Department of Architecture at UIC in Chicago. Pierre Boulanger, who's an uh, influential source on the uh, emerging debates around the notion of landscape urbanism. Doug Stockman, who's a leading practitioner in the design build film, field uh, coming from Kansas as part of the AIA Honor Awards keynote lecture. And finally, Garth Myers, who is uh, representing city and regional planning in the series, talking about informality in, in African cities. And so the series as a whole is as typical, is meant to uh, talk to the different aspects of the school. But one, um, one thing that may go unnoticed in these KSA lecture series is that they're officially called the Baumer lecture series. And they're made possible uh, by the school's generous Baumer endowment. So I'd like to speak for a few moments about this gentleman, Herbert Baumer. I personally never knew anything about him, who he was, or who he was, so I did a little research into the school archives. Herbert Baumer was a longtime professor of architecture here at Ohio State. He was born in Alabama, studied at the Beaux-Arts, served as an army lieutenant in the First World War, after which he finished his diploma in Paris at the Beaux-Arts, worked as a designer for Severance and Van Allen, the firm best known for the design of the Chrysler Building. In 1922, he came to Ohio State as both professor and university architect. In that time, he designed a number of buildings around the campus, the Orton Memorial Library, Arps Hall, the Chemistry Building, and Derby Hall. Then he then served as a lieutenant colonel in the Air Corps during World War II and returned to Ohio State where he continued teaching, becoming an emeritus professor in 1956. Having looked into the fi Baumer files, I found all sorts of interesting documents, lecture notes, teaching contracts, letters of recommendations. One thing I'd like to share with you tonight is an article that he wrote in the 30s discussing what was then the most hotly debated topic in uh, architectural academia. That is the relative worth of historical versus modern styles. And, and what was interesting that he finds primarily the worth of the modern is its value and in instruction, to quote from Baumer. Having no consecrated forms, a teacher in dealing with it, that is the modern, is forced into an analysis of things and into a line of reasonings about them that makes clearness and logic, and it is the things that are clear and logical that can be readily taught. And I find in this uh, sediment a kind of like mind, and the hope is uh, with tonight's lecture to sort of offer a clarity of thought uh, in my own looking at architecture and for the lecture series as well to sort of keep that notion of clarity of our visitors uh, in mind as well. So then finally to the lecture proper, claim jumping. What is claim jumping? To illustrate, I will use an example from Deadwood, an HBO series that focused on the outlaw gold rush town of Deadwood in the Dakota territories in the, in the 1870s. As creator David Milch has pointed out repeatedly in interviews, 
The intent of the show is to study the way that civilization comes together from chaos. So what we have here is uh, Al Swearington in the middle, who's the sort of uh, big boss of the town, and he's trying to create a sort of uh, claim jump, as it were. Uh, the outline of which is that he has the punk uh, trying to sell land to the dandy, the owl and the punk know that there's no gold to be found on the land, so they're basically trying to sell him a worthless bit of land. But as it turns out, there's gold on the land and a lot of gold, so they end up killing the punk and trying to buy back the land from the dandy. They also kill the dandy. All this around various machinations involving propriety and, more significantly, territory. So the dictionary definition is to enter upon and take possession of land to which another has acquired a claim by prior entry and occupation. And I, and I think, um, that's what it is. Uh, and what I'd like to do is take that notion of, of claim jumping from its uh, mineral roots and apply it to uh, architecture. So the retitled title is Claim Jumping Our Architecture's Prospects for Change and to try to uh, articulate and delineate how architecture has changed its territory that has claim jumped in the past and continues to do so in the present and in the future as a means of making architectural civilization, that is, disciplinarity, come together from chaos. As I've already mentioned, uh, Tonight's lecture, my own, is like many other uh, lectures from KSA faculty, uh, and they're intended to provide a means for the school to understand the breadth and depth of its own production in relation to the rest of the field represented by invited lecturers. Since this occasion not only marks my promotion to associate professor, uh, I just got the official letter this morning, which I'm glad to get, as well as assuming the role of architects or section head, it makes sense for me to speak to both. This lecture also marks the five years that I've been here at OSU. And to commemorate the work that I've done in that time through writing, which has been my primary form of production, uh, I'd like to offer five histories that I've written over the course of the last five years. These will be sort of um, footnote or cliff note versions of these arguments. The first history deals with the relationship of program to form. And this essay began at my first appearance at, at the KSA, at this lectern, in fact, uh, at a conference on program that was organized by Jeff Kipnis in November of 2004, shortly before I began teaching here. The lecture also became an essay that was subsequently published in practice, Praxis under the title Notes on the Adaptive Reuse of Program. The essay starts with the observation made by the architectural historian John Summerston that it is program, not geometry or material, that marks the novel achievement of modern architecture. I then explain in the essay how the idea of program itself is an instable concept, an idea that undergoes constant revision by various architectural ideologies, and that the best way to understand uh, program is in its adaptive reuse. I'm taking the term adaptive reuse here from real estate terminology, which means a space that's used for something other than its intended purposes. The prime case in modern architecture of the idea of program is to be found in the adage, form follows function. And the best example of this idea I could find is Melnikov's Rostov Club of 1927. And here, the, um, you see it here, it's the top image on the left. And it's the idea that the, uh, what you see are these, the rakes of the auditorium coming out of the volume, so somehow expressing the form of the auditorium, much like we are now, with the, with the angled floor to facilitate view becoming expressive on the form. Um, but in looking at it further, what I found is that typically modern architecture had two other manifestations. One was either the mute accommodation of program, in the case of somebody like Mies, who we see below, or in, the, case, in the, the use of program from one activity to define the form of another, as in the case of Corbusier's use of the ramp, which was originally appears in his design as a way of transporting cattle in a slaughterhouse, but then gets re-situated as a part of his 
architectural uh, promenade. Um, and this sort of inability to successfully replicate the modernist desiratum of form follows function generated um, in the development of architecture need to formulate the position for architecture vis-a-vis -vis function which did not replicate this problem. So it could be could argued that this became a point of uh, contention for the advanced architecture of the 70s, where architects like Peter Eisenman, Robert Maturi, and Aldo Rossi, in various degrees, turned away from program and to form, using to, to form and to images and to, to the city, respectively, as replacements for program. I then go on to say that the idea of program gets picked up again in the work of people like Rem Kuhas and Bernard Schumi in their rereading of something like uh, Bentham's Panopticon and in its, with its associations of programs that are not concerned primarily with their formal disposition, but with their diagrammatic arrangement. This reading of the diagram, by the way, of philosophers like Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze, has in turn informed architectural production in relation to processes of formation. But this engagement has moved in time increasingly away from the insights of diagrams of power instead to diagrams of materiality. And I conclude with some suggestion that the productive unachievability of program in its implication and form is not something to be resisted, but is rather a kind of productive problematic that needs to be engaged again and again. And in the footnotes, I try to sort it all out. Uh, but also in the next history, I try to reread the same issue from a different perspective. And this was a piece that was written for us, issue of perspective called Monsters. Um, and with it, I respond by creating a kind of neologism, um, which can be read here, you can see here, which is intended to be read as both ruination and rumination. And it's the play of these two terms that the history gets written around. Um, the first term of ruination that, that I intended was basically an observation of the architecture of the 70s, which you can sort of see here in a brief catalog form, and in different ways, either through the, the literal ruin of something like sight, or the evocation of ruin in something like uh, Gary's work, or the notation of ruin in something like Venturi or, or Eisenman in different ways, sees this sort of recurrent motif of the ruin appearing formally in the work. In the second, iteration of, of ruination, which has to do with the causes of, of ruin, I want to suggest that the, this move to the motif of the formal ruin comes out of a sense of impossibility that one found the project of modern architecture in the 70s in the example of basically certain perceived failures at that time. So here you have things like the destruction of Pruitt Igo, which could be seen as a failure of the social program of housing, the destruction of McKinney, Mead, and White's um, Pennsylvania Station, which made way for Madison Square Garden, which could be perceived as a failure of history, the fire at Buckminster Fuller's uh, Dome in Montreal, which could be seen as a failure of technology, and finally the fire, or rather arson, at uh, Paul Rudolph's a a building, which could be seen as a sort of failure of pedagogy. So these two uh, conditions I think, start to imply the second term, this notion of rumination. And rumination here means basically a kind of cyclical thought, a thought that recurs again and again. And, and what I want to suggest is that this dual condition of rumination precipitated this third condition of rumination in terms of a cyclical thinking as the kind of generative um, moment for the emergence of architectural theory in the 70s, that the theory of the 70s becomes a way of ruminating over this perceived failure in a kind of cyclical affirmation of its own incapacities. And then further go on in the argument with the second valence of this notion of rumination, which rumination also means the sort of ingestion of non-nutritious material. So, uh, cow eats the grass, he ruins the grass eating this non-nutrition material. And I want to suggest that there was a way in which there was a certain sort of configuration of thought in the 70s, which we seemingly moved beyond, but still somehow haunts the discipline. I then go on to try to describe the state of current practice 
uh, in the form of zombies, which are both a sort of model of the rumen because they're ingesting material that's not nutritious for them. It's an act of repetition. But in another way, suggests a kind of positive, uh, constructive model that comes out of the zombies in that it's really all about a sort of mob, emergent mob intelligence that I think a lot of the work responds to. And I think a lot of the contemporary work where we see something like Aranda Lash's uh, entry into the PS1 competition from a few years ago is reenacting the, these haunts from the 70s in a way that um, is, in a way, very constructive, but in a way also removed from its initiating arguments. Uh, the third history um, that I'd like to suggest is, comes from a, a small piece that I wrote for a former Lefevre fellow, Jimenez Lai, to describe his work for his end of year show. And if you're not familiar with Jim's work, what they are are basically cartoons of visionary architecture schemes that use um, outlandish conjectures, like what if the teleporters for Star Trek were real, to uh, re-envision things like what that would do to the global distribution of goods. What intrigued me about Jim's installation was the title that he chose for it, which was called No Place, or the architecture of No Place, which of course, to me, uh, created a, uh, a sort of thought about what he meant by no place. And of course, when you go back to thinking about utopia, or the definition of the word utopia, utopia actually means, as he, as he points out, it means no place. It doesn't mean the good place, which is also utopia, but spelled with an E and not a U in the Greek, which this utopia with an E means good place. This is the, the thing we're going trying to go to. But the utopia that we always refer to, the utopia with you, is, is a non-place. And I thought that was a very interesting tension in his own work. The model that I wanted to use to try to describe uh, Jim's work came out of comics themselves, and it has to do with this idea of continuity in comics. Um, the, the thing about comics, the superhero books, if you will, is that they exist in this universe, and the, the idea of continuity is very important. So it's very important that we know that Superman came from Krypton and not from Mars, that we always refer to as coming from Krypton, and we don't create inconsistencies within that universe. And so what happened within the discursive universe of something like DC Comics was that at a certain point, it had, the stories had been told so long, and there are so many different versions of it, that the story started to conflict. And so what they did is they had this big uh, event, this crisis on multiple Earths, where they took all these stories that happened on all these supposedly different Earths where people were going back and forth, and they consolidated it. Does anybody remember Beppo the super chimp? Okay, they got rid of Beppo. And basically consolidated the universe, the comic universe, into a, a single narrative that had structure and cohesion and continuity again. But the problem with that was that one of the interesting things about these comic universes is that people want to read about how these characters interact in different situations. So by creating a sort of realm of absolute continuity, they limited the potential to tell weird stories, like what if Superman had come to Russia instead of America? And what they did is they made a new series of comics, a new imprint that they called Elseworlds. And these were ways in which they could tell stories about the same heroes that basically existed outside of continuity. They offered models that could enact other stories but wouldn't interfere with that. And, and what I really saw in Jim's work was that it wasn't really a, a no place, but it was instead it was itself like one of these else worlds, where the detritus of visionary schemes could be reworked as alternative histories where the megastructures of, say, of the 60s were not dismissed as impossible, but rather implemented on much larger scales. The vocation of his work seemed to be entirely useful, not as a failed utopia, as they always are, but rather successful impossibilities which point to other real possibilities. Um, the next piece uh, come, it's been published this year a couple of times, first in Thresholds, which is the MIT Student Journal, and comes out of some work uh, for a seminar that I did here at OSU called Design for uh, the Apocalypse. 
Um, and basically, the question of why the apocalypse now was based on a kind of survey of the field now with things like 2012 coming up and the supposed end of the Mayan calendar or things like global warming, all sorts of factors. We seem to see a kind of active imagination of the end of times, the, the apocalypse. You can see on things like on the History Channel, there are no longer just histories of what has happened, but now with computer animation, whole documentaries about possible ways the world will end. So this seemed like a kind of cultural fascination that I wanted to try to address in some way and try to think about what it could mean for architecture. And, and what, I, what I would wish to propose is that um, the idea of utopia has been an active motif within architectural thought or with design thought. The notion of a progressive betterment that would happen over time if we worked hard enough and waited long enough. But then, as we know from Jim's work or and other, uh, that the utopia is always a non-place. It was never, it was always, it's always just beyond our grasp. And what I'd like to suggest is that instead of utopia, if we think about something like the apocalypse, where if utopia is, is no place, the apocalypse, as you write it, is every place. The thing about the apocalypse as an idea is that it's ubiquitous and unavoidable. It's not, it's also a fantasy in a way, but it's, it's one that is about ubiquity as, a, as opposed to the removal of, the future removal that you would have for something like utopia. Um, and what, for me, it suggests is not that in a way, we literally designed bomb shelters for the apocalypse. But when you start to look at apocalyptic thought as it manifests in movies and novels and, and all sorts of matter, is that the apocalypse is always encoded not as an end of things, but as a, an utterly new and complete beginning of things. So like with the Mayan calendar, it's not the end of the world, it's the end of an age, but then it starts another age. Or even if you take it to things like there was a book written a couple years ago called The World Without Us, which basically just catalogs what would happen to cities, buildings, if man went away. And the end, it's really not about the removal of man. It's, it's about the way that without man, the earth would start to re-regulate its own system. So even when something as dire as that, it's always about a new possibility to begin it. Now, and the other thing that I think the apocalypse for design what it makes us think about is that if we look at something like architecture and its utopian uh, ambitions, or even just in general, architecture and design is something that I think in a lot of ways has been generated out of a sense of plenitude. If we think about architecture as something being more than building, think of that more than. It's about a plenitude of either resources or time or effort or attention. And this is the thing that's characterized architectural production. And so, it, as an experiment in thought, it seems interesting to try to think about what if instead of operating on senses of plenitude, we operated on models of scarcity? Because the other thing about this apocalyptic mode is that things become very reduced. You have to rethink situations. And I think that notion of scarcity, of like true and radical scarcity, could be an interesting way of rethinking certain sort of formats of architectural thought. The final piece is one that I was supposed to be done now. Hopefully, it'll be done tomorrow. Uh, there's still a little work to do. Um, and it's written for this year's um, entry to the PS1 competition as won by Moss, which is Michael Meredith and Hillary Sample, uh, to be published in Domus. Um, and so this one's a little rougher. But basically, the argument is that Moss has entered this competition three times uh, before winning this year. And what I'd like to sort of set out is that their sets of entries offers it as a set not only a trajectory of their own development, but a kind of commentary on the genre that the PS1 competition has become. And for this audience, you're probably no doubt familiar with the PS1 competition. It's been around for 10 years. It's been repeated a number of times so that there are now uh, observable um, trajectories to the kind of solutions that's been suggested. In fact, Michael 
uh, Meredith had written a piece for Praxis charting exactly these sort of recurrences of format. Um, and so what I think with their work, having seen this trajectory, they're not, I would say, not trying to offer a radical alternatives to what's been done before, but trying to twist the model as it's been established and also to use that opportunity to comment on the field at large. So in this entry from, 19, uh, from 2004, they have this open netting, which provides both a canopy and you can crawl onto it as a, as a sort of lounge space. And I think it serves its function, as it were, to operate in this competition, but also I think is a commentary on both the continuous surface projects that we've seen over the last 15 years and the green roof projects in terms of its inhabitability. But you know, it's both those things, but it's also open, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or in this example from 2007, where they've made this canopy out of these inflated mylar balloons, which gives you, one, this sort of canopy that sways in the wind, but it also can be understood as the achievement of a kind of animate intricacy, but one that operates out of materiality uh, as opposed to form. So you can see these on YouTube. If you watch the video, the sway of the mylar creates the sort of proliferic reflections, not as a complete image, but as these sort of um, micro textures of the light and shade as it moves and glimmers across, across it, um, across the form. And then there's finally this year's, uh, the winning entry, which is again, another version of the, can uh, of the canopy. Um, and frankly, this is the part I haven't written yet. So we'll leave that, we'll leave that alone for now. Okay, so having written these, these essays and having made certain observations or assertions, um, there's another history that falls out of this previous effort. A kind of de facto shorthand of where I see architecture today that builds on these previous efforts and is sort of my like, current um, synthetic gesture towards uh, these previous efforts. So, Let's start with a crisis because all good histories tend to start and end with crises. And here I'd like to start with the oil crisis of 1973. Uh, things are gonna pick up a little bit. Uh, and out of the oil crisis, we could see that there was a kind of bifurcation in architectural intelligence into two arenas. So here we have basically autonomous architecture represented by, by Peter Eisenman or underground dwelling represented by the sort of um, passive energy arguments. And that I think in this moment is when the intentions of architecture really took on the one hand this, this sort of theoretical formal autonomous interest and on the other hand the sort of uh, energy uh, and performance issues. And a sort of like division occurred at this moment between these, these two trends. Uh, and then, of course, um, as, as I've mentioned in the other arguments, out of this division, you have people like Manfredo Tafuri here in this, in this drawing uh, made by the architect Aldo Rossi called Architecture Assassine, which he drew specifically for this book by Manfredo Tafuri, where you have um, a number of commentators, but primarily somebody like Manfredo Tafuri, who speaks to the fact that architecture has gotten very good at its, its aims to address its own language as a form, but also has therein lost a certain kind of connectivity to the world at large. And the way Winfrey refers to this in another essay is the architecture of the boudoir, the boudoir being the realm of architecture in which pleasures are enacted, but they're also confined. And, and his point is that this bifurcation is absolutely complete. So there can be architecture, which he thinks in a way is great, and there can be something like building practices, but they're really two different, two different animals. Fast forward a few years, we have something like Dubai, uh, which we all know the story very well. It's seen this sort of incredible amount of growth. Uh, Dubai is not an oil producing nation itself, but I think its wealth is predicated on, on oil, which in a way is a sort of mirror image to the oil crisis. And in this 
we have seen a kind of, in its proliferation of building, we see the enactment of any number of architectural ambitions that had been built up over that time in the 70s when architects weren't building. I should say again, the thing about the oil crisis and the division between autonomous architecture and underground buildings, I would say is that removal to the academy where in the academy architects worked on issues of form and now with the new levels of capital, the fruits of that research now have a chance to be realized and built and, and it's a sort of um, collection of, of that pent up desire to build things in the world that were forged elsewhere. But again, I think in a way, I would say there's a kind of apotheosis of that moment. And you can see here, we can just um, uh, make reference to something like Al Gore here in Inconvenient Truth, where he's showing the effects of global warming. Uh, we've also seen the collapse of markets and, and other things like that, so that the, 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 the capital and convenience, and I would say again, the plenitudes, which enabled a certain kind of production to take place, are now facing another set of issues that call into question, not the validity of production, but its very possibility in that same mode. So to that end, I would, I would say the dilemma we face now is sort of you know, this dilemma. Here we have uh, the painting by Thomas Cole, the architect's dream, the architect uh, recumbent on the column, surrounded by the monuments of history, looking through possibility. Here you see uh, another scene from the video game Fallout. And the question is, how does, how does architecture operate in this kind of um, change of circumstance, as it were? And, and what I'd like to suggest is that, see now, as I get further along, I remember parts I left out. So the thing about the ruination that we talked about before and all these things, this notion is described as a kind of death, uh, a kind of death of architecture is what I'd like to, um, these sort of crisis models, however you want to uh, discuss it, like this notion of the crisis or the end of architecture, or the end of whatever, these are sort of cyclical occurrences. And what I'd like to suggest is that when we talk about a change in the architecture, that rather than thinking about architecture as a complete narrative continuity from the pyramids to the Seattle Public Library, then instead we realize that architecture, what we call architecture, which this thing that we give the same name to again and again, might actually be entirely different ontologies. They might be entirely different conceptions of the stuff that surrounds building and thinking about buildings, have totally different argumentative structures, have totally different ambitions. And then in fact, we, we go through these quite frequently and then we could, we could imagine that there was one, an end and beginning of one kind of architecture at another point, and again and again. And the question for me now, and I think it's a question that's um, ubiquitous is, what is the next iteration of this architecture thesis and how can we start to, to think about it? Um, my answer for that is something I've been kicking around for the last year, is this new casualty model. And again, the, the title is, is meant to be, on the one hand, like a casualty, like another, yet another death of architecture, but to also evoke notions of causality, to think about like, what are the causal effects of what architecture does? How does it rethink its engagement with the world and its productive ambitions? But then also not to encode it within the sort of dire um, hair shirt of uh, doom and gloom, but to introduce uh, a kind of lightness and a sort of casualness of engagement with these things. So the new architectural attitude, I would think, this next iteration of the architectural thesis would encode these, these ideas. And I have five points that I would like to make to that end of what I think goes into it. And the first, I think, has to do with how we explain uh, and understand design, and it has to do with making quantification count. Here you can see an example of a very simple diagram that if it were to the right scale, and it's not, shows the relative aspect ratios of different forms of 
audio-visual interfaces, everything from an iPhone to a widescreen television and beyond. And in that simple comparison, I find it very productive to understand the differences they imply. Much more instructive to see it in the graphic version than to read those, those numerical aspect ratios there. So I think basically seeing the quantifications and starting to understand those ambitions is a bit what we should focus attention on. Here you can see something like the square footage per person calculated in terms of their relative size for areas around the globe. Or you can see something like in this diagram made at Rice University where they've basically taken the perimeter ring roads of various world towns and situated them one on top of the other. So you can really start to have uh, an understanding of the comparative difference between these things and start to engage that matter. Or an example is something like this, um, which is a redescription of a project by uh, Soleri for his uh, Babylon project, redescribed by Work AC as part of their uh, 49 Cities project, where they take the, the formal aspects of the design and then try to break it down into a quantifiable set of measurements. The other point, or the next point, has to do with building on that rational design, understanding of quantity and quality in the field to use that knowledge further to reimagine systems. So this is, a, I just love this image. This is, this is basically a Google Earth image of Moses parting the Red Sea. Um, and I think this kind of scale of ambition is, is a bit where we need to start rethinking systems. And that can be everything from something like this diagram. You can read, we can't read the caption, but it's the, the caption of the diagram is basically cities make weather. So to start to understand the, the productive relationship of the systems as they operate to other examples where, like in this one, where the uh, description of the natural object through uh, geometric rigor, or in something like this, which was a, came out of a mathematics study in the principles of stacking and what the achievable cantilevers are through different means of these building blocks, sort of looking at this material and, and trying to reimagine the possibilities that come out of it. Uh, and to this project, which is by Matthias Bau, who will be coming here in a few weeks for one architecture, where they rethink the whole notion of the park and the landscape around the idea of the circle, but in a way that the circle is congruent with the systemic needs for the vehicular circulation and other ideas. Uh, catching up to myself. Uh, the third point concerns a topic which we could say uh, the topic formally known as function, uh, and that we need to use instrumentality uh, in our work. So in architecture, we sometimes get caught up in the cultural resonance of our production, and I think we need to reconnect to a sort of kind of brutal clarity about our means and our end. This panini maker is both the product of a society and a cuisine that connects to a certain culture, but it's also a symbol machine to smash together a sandwich and introduce heat quickly. And I just like it, it's blocky and chunky. Uh, here's an example of somebody smashing a metal cube to make a chair. Um, I liked it because it was brutal. Or we can uh, intervene into conventions and add value to seemingly prosaic situations with the use of design intelligence. Let's take the scheme here by Moss Architects again for their um, Oda Ordo's house. It can be described as an atomization of a house into an assemblage of self-similar repertoire of form, but can also be understood as a pragmatic response to an issue of building. Here the pyramidal forms are heat chimneys which allow for passive cooling by the use of the heat chimney phenomenon. Fourth points to the issue of appearance. Uh, which is to have it look like something else. Uh, this diagram explains what's known as the uncanny valley. If you're not familiar with the term, the uncanny valley is this, um, has to do with the appearance of humanity and things like robots and puppets. And what it points out is that like, basically 
there's a good response to basically a person, and there's a good response to a puppet, but things that are too close to the human, but not human, create this, what's known as the uncanny valley. And I think architecture can respond to a notion like the uncanny valley by taking two sides. One, we could focus on the extreme right, in which we would sort of work on the exact replications of the existing conventions of building qua building, or perhaps more interestingly, we could use those conventions as a loose evocation. Um, like in this uh, suggested example of a city constructed out of cutlery, or similarly, a city out of plastic bowls, or in this example by the Danish firm Bjart Ingels Group, which takes the, the, Dan yeah, the Danish firm Bjart Ingels Group, which takes the dimensional format of Legos, also a Danish project product, to provide both the means of constructing the model, but also as a guide to suggest specific architectural figurations, in which case they're used to maximize solar exposure for a housing complex. Finally, the final point with has, has to do with what I would call the persona of the architect, and that is the need to act like an architect. To describe someone as an architect is to say something that they are the one who is responsible for, for both the form and the content of the new. Think of Irving Kristol as the architect of neoconservatism, or Robert McNamara as the architect of the Korean War, or v Vietnam War, or Phil Spector as the architect of the Motown Wall of Sound. These are all, for granted good or ill, originators and facilitators of unprecedented forms of organization. The architect operates in a variety of contexts and in a variety of formats, in drawings, in texts, in schedules, in conversations. What unites these expressions is the ability to organize the means at hand into something that commands both attention and direction. There is a reason why the evocation of architects bring forth associations with vision and control. It is because architects and architecture itself operate as the embodiment par excellence of the man or woman with a plan. Ultimately, what we do in this school is train people who make the world, and we should not apologize for that, but should embrace it and claim it. So then, where are we now as a profession and as a school? In some ways, we are like the farm, protecting ourselves from a rising tide of indifference behind a sandbagging of internalization. What we need is a way off the island model and a means of navigating this turbulence. The world is changing economically, environmentally, and culturally. These require responses and not speculations. In the face of these changes, architecture is confronted with its own unique dilemma. It is blessed with a great legacy of thought, technology, and technique that responds to the world, but it plays an increasingly diminished role in the creation of that world. While each generation of architects has positioned its own crisis, the issue now is not stylistic but disciplinary. Not the type of architecture, but the continuing existence of architecture itself. Architecture is challenged by the ongoing acquiescence of area, the ongoing acquiescence of areas of professional responsibility to more nimble offshoots, and even more profoundly by the delamination of its own conceptual formation. In the past, the question was how to define what architecture might be. Now the question is what architecture might do. As a model, I look to Commandy, the last boy on earth. What I want to suggest is we, architects, the school, architecture, are like Commandy. Uh, Commandy, if you don't know Commandy, I guess you don't. Uh, Commandy was a, a comic drawn by the artist Jack Kirby. It describes the last boy on Earth in this sort of post-apocalyptic world that he exists in. Um, he's literally the last human, and he has to make his way in the world in this um, basically what I would call a kind of re-territorialized area. This image shows the world of Commandy. It is a map that should look both familiar and foreign to us. It is a world based on the basic outlines of our own, but one that has been re-territorialized by new features and new constituencies. And I would, would like to suggest that we, like Commandy, are already existing in this re-territorialized world. Uh, here you can see we used Commandy as inspiration for the poster this fall, but due to copyrights, we sort of claim jumped it, as it were. Uh, but within the world at large, and boiled down to what's in the school, what's, what I'd like to say is what's presented tonight 
uh, is part of we, what we could say is a voyage already well underway. That the school itself has already been re-territorialized. That this is not the description of a new condition, but already a process continually well underway. Architecture education is uniquely positioned to address this condition, not only in the training of its future practitioners, but in the way in which pedagogy, pedagogy provides new models for the profession. The school's mission must be reconceptualize the teaching of architecture. Architecture must resist the continual elaboration of its internalized codes and reestablish itself within its productive and projective capacities. The redeployment of its conceptual legacies, the strengthening of its technical competencies, and the retooling of its techniques. In this territory, in the KSA, and in our respective disciplines of architecture, landscape, and city regional planning, we continue, as we always have, to devote our energies to such an endeavor. It is an ongoing effort, a journey of discovery seemingly without end, but one that is continually necessary. By way of conclusion, I would like to offer my gratitude to the school, both students and faculty who over the last five years have given me a context to be an architect, a historian, and an educator, and to think about where architecture has been and where it might be going. Also, to all of you sitting here tonight, I appreciate you listening to my efforts in this regard. To all then, thank you. So, I usually ask the first question out of whatever. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good, I don't have any questions. <laughs> but if any of you do, uh, I'll take them. Jane. Sure, I, I, think, I think that's a great question. I, I think I can. I mean, basically it's like, out of this lecture, how do you respond to architecture's continued possibility amidst these other pressures of things like environmentalism, sustainability, things like that. I, I, and what I wanna suggest is that, I think architecture and the other field, but I'll talk about my own for the moment, I think it's, it's both necessary and inevitable, and, but also, aside from that, important. I mean, I do think architecture has and continues to play a role in thinking through these, these factors, in a way, in a way that continues its own long trajectory, but also reformulates them. And, and I go back to the way in which I think, you know, Architecture has its foundation within the art and science of building, but also I do think that its continuation out of that spawns a kind of model for thinking about design. I think it's a kind of foundational model for thinking through the problems and issues and possibilities of design, not only for itself, but I think for culture at large. So our productions within architecture, and maybe in the degree I speak to other fields, is not only the design of the thing we do, but the possibility about thinking about how to do these things in ways that are unprecedented, novel, but also intelligent. So I think in some ways, you know, the answers we come to the things aren't simply the answers that come transparently out of the material, but provide ways of thinking. I mean, architects think synthetically about lots of different things, and I think what I'd like to say is the primary value of architecture is both its, its history and its experience with that synthetic thinking that will be applied again and again to another set of issues. So like, basically I think the difference between now and the 70s that I'd like to suggest is that in the 70s, 
the bifurcation was absolutely complete. So people really focused on like the solar building and they did the things and they got to a certain point with a problem that doesn't have an answer. So similar to the issue of program, like you can never find the conceptual model that completely uh, allies form and program together, but it's a continual dilemma that gets rethought in different ways over time. And I think architecture and its engagements with thinking about organization and design offers models that continually renew based on new problems. So I think, you know, what I'm, it's, it's a bit mealy mouth to say that we'll do it better because we'll do it together, but I do think the movement now is not, is to both specialize and be particular about our engagements, but also to retain architecture's ability to think both and instead of either or. That's a long way to say. Yeah. It's not what I was saying. Any other questions? Can you put him, can, like Jeopardy, can you put him in the form of this? No, I, no I, I understand the, I mean, and I think this notion, I think you're right on this notion of the casual, and what I'm trying to suggest, I think, is a, is, as you say, a non-dialectical model where the occurrence of certain possibilities that come, not necessarily generate the architecture, but uh, participate in the architecture's form are admissible evidence. So for me, the, it doesn't matter if the heat chimney idea precedes or follows the pyramidal form. At some point, they're coincident. And so it's just as reasonable to talk about its formal characteristics and its performative characteristics. One doesn't obliterate the other. And, 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 I, and I just think that's a shift in thinking from something like an essay that I found very useful because it's so utterly clear on the matter is something like Eisenman's post-functionalism, which I think is a real bellwether in the artic it's the most concise articulation of the arguments for autonomy, because it gives you a, lit a litany of things that are involved in architecture, structure, uh, um, program, et cetera, et cetera, but that because of their inclusion, but not their speaking to the essential qualities of architecture become inadmissible evidence in discussion of this other thing. And so what I would want to suggest is that the possibility is to talk about this other thing of architecture in relation to these factors as opposed to being negatively defined against it. And that's just, I think, where I'm trying to shift the argument. No, I think that's fair. I mean, the, the long history of the school now, everybody in this building has uh, come here since then, but like there was a studio that Bob Solomon and I did together a number of years ago when he was still here, which was called Lazy and Undisciplined. And the students joked that basically in the end it took a lot of work to create the affect of laziness and indifference and to do those things. So I think this casual doesn't, you know, 
I went with the surfer. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> Anne wasn't talking about me. I mean, and even in that example, it was through effort, intelligence, work, I would say design, that the ease, grace, I would say casual attitude towards the wave were precipitated. And so I think there's a connection between those that I would want to hold together. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Good night.